retirement, and, and uh, God bless you. Thank you very much. I don't like cats either. Sorry to any of you cat lovers who, who do, but anyway. <clears throat> it's, uh, I'm really happy to be here this morning. I have been, well, I guess I've spoken to the seniors over there somewhere on the other side of the church. And uh, at Christmas time a couple of years ago, I know uh, some of you from up at Camp Oshkady, up, up at Camp Oshkady and over the years and snow camps and so on. And so it's good to finally be here in your church. I, uh, <clears throat> plus, my, one of my daughter-in-laws, Kim Friesen, if you go back in this church a little ways here, uh, she was uh, raised for quite a few years in this church, and she's a great daughter-in-law. Uh, <clears throat> congrats on, on uh, finding a new pastor. That as you probably have learned, is a very difficult job these days. And it's not because any committee that's working on it is working slow. It's just a hard job. And uh, so congratulations on that. That's, that's great. Sorry my wife isn't here this morning, but she has leukemia, and the particular leukemia she has is the one that takes away your immunity, so put that together with COVID-19 and uh, she, she stays put at home quite a bit because of that. So sorry she's not here. Sometimes in the process of the, of the years, I have given my sermon to my wife to look over, take out any parts that are not done well enough or uh, she felt didn't need to be say, said. So in conclusion this morning, <laughs> as a pastor over the years, I pastored for 35, just more than 35 years. One of the difficult things is when you face somebody who has just been in a very unfortunate circumstance or accident, and they're crying and looking at you and say, Pastor, why? Or why me, to make it even more specific? I'll just give you one quick illustration. I remember when I pastored in Alberta in one of the churches there, a girl by the name of Linda, who was 21 years old at the time, and she came to our church regularly, and she was well acclaimed with for her violin playing. She played with the Edmonton Symphony some of the time, traveled right across Canada, all because of the violin. And uh, computers were, uh, hadn't been around too long and she had sort of risen to the top and everybody knew her around town as being one who was very good at using this computer for the various things which it was meant to achieve. But at this particular moment, I was standing in the hospital, <clears throat> in the hospital beside her bed, and she was lying there sobbing and, say <clears throat> and saying to me, Pastor, why did God allow the first two fingers on my left hand to be cut off this morning in a farm accident? Now, lest you think pastors have a good job, what would you say? Think about it. What would you say? That's a hard job. And uh, my heart went out to her. You know, there was her favorite pastime. She just bought a new violin from Europe somewhere for several thousand dollars. And I don't know what was going to happen to her uh, job. Why? Why God? Well, there's no place in the script, no one place in the scripture which gives you a complete answer for that kind of situation. But the verses I would like to look at this morning in Deuteronomy chapter 32, 
do give you a partial answer to that. <clears throat> and uh, chapter 32 is right near the end of Deuteronomy. I think there's only one or no, there's two chapters more. This is at the end of Moses' life. He's speaking to the Israelites. And in this one part here, we have what we call Moses' song. Now, if you go down in chapter 32, and for time's sake, I won't read all the verses, but just look at, look at verse 11. Now, he's, he's saying this to the people in Israel, and he says, As the eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings, and then it says, so the Lord. Now in some of your Bibles it says uh, probably Jacob there, but as you know, Jacob is a term that is used in some parts of the Bible to refer to Israel, which it does here. So as an eagle does these things with their eaglets, so the Lord does with his children. It's a very interesting, very interesting verse. The eagle is a marvelous, marvelous bird. Big, majestic, they say very, very clever. And, and uh, also very common to the children of Israel, especially those who had gone through the 40 years in the wilderness, obviously. But they're just a tremendous bird. <clears throat> and... Uh, you know, they, they tell me, I haven't seen this, but they'll tell me that uh, a, an eagle will swoop down just really making time going down and grab their prey and then go way up in the air and drop that prey on some rocky area to kill it. And then they'll come down and pick that up and take it away to their nest or wherever they eat it. And it's quite a bird. <clears throat> Suffice it to say that the Lord inspired the writers of our Word of God to mention an eagle 32 times in the Scriptures. 32 times. And so there's, there's some good lessons that can be learned from this. So in verse 11, it says, Like the eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spread its wings to each... To, to catch them and carries them on your so the Lord deals with us. Why in the world would the mother eagle stir up her nest, which she took so much time to build in the first place, and in which her little eaglets are dwelling? <clears throat> well, there's a reason for it. And that is at a certain time when the mother realizes that this little eaglet has grown enough and now she's got the right, the eaglet has got the right feathers on her wings and on her tail and so on, then she knows it's time for this little guy to learn to fly. But this little eaglet has got so comfortable in this nest over the process of time and that's such a long way down he doesn't want to learn to fly. He doesn't want to learn to leave the nest. Now, if you know anything about eagles, you know that in different parts of the world, they make their nests differently. And in this part, in that part of the world, Holy Land, the eagle first would go out and get some sticks and, and weave them together to may start, a, <clears throat> start a nest. And uh, then she would go and get some thorns and thistles and glass and sharp rock and she would put those on top of those sticks. Sounds logical, right? And then, after that, she would go out and find some fur and wool and feathers and so on. If you look this up online, you'd, you'd, you'd find all this out. And she would pad this nest with a, a, quite a thick layer of all this soft, cozy stuff. And now into that nest, these little eaglets are born, and they're hatched. 
and they just love this nest because it's so comfortable and so wonderful and the panoramic view of everything because usually those nests were on the highest thing they could find to build on. And it's so comfortable there that they just, they love that nest. However, the little eaglet must someday leave that nest and learn to fly. Problem? He doesn't want to. Because he's comfortable, warm, and cozy. And uh, he doesn't want to learn to fly. And the mother tries to get him to leave the nest, but to no avail. Therefore, are you with me? The mother stirs up the nest. Well, what's down underneath there? These sharp things I talked about. And she stirs up the nest so that these thorns and thistles and glass and sharp Objects start to protrude through the feathers into this soft little butterball called an, uh, an eaglet. And pretty soon he's in a little bit of pain and agony. And he starts to look around and he's almost getting discontent with the, the, with the nest. Aha. Uh -huh. But he's still not quite ready to go. Now remember, I'll cut there for a second now as the eagle so the Lord does the Lord ever stir up our nest well the word of God says yes he does remember in the early part of the New Testament there God had said go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and let them know about Christ, etc. The disciples, did they go out into the world? No, they didn't. Why not? Well, they were based at that time, for the most part, around Jerusalem. Jerusalem was the big church that had everything. And so they didn't like to leave the shall I say, cozy nest. <laughs> and they stayed in Jerusalem, and they never did go out and, and become what they should and, and preach, the world, uh, preach the gospel to the rest of the world. And if you don't think they were having a good time, just remember some of the scripture that you already know, because at one point in Jerusalem there, there was some preaching, and 3,000 people came to Christ. I bet you wouldn't have a dry eye if you were there. 3,000 people came to Christ, were baptized, and joined the church that day. And another time, 5,000 people. Well, I tell you, when I used to watch Billy Graham years ago and see even just a few dozen people coming down the aisle, I'd get all teary-eyed. And here's 3,000, here's 5,000. I mean, Peter was known as evangelist. You could call him to come in and preach an evangelistic series, I suppose. And uh, you could call uh, Luke to come and speak at a snow camp. No, I guess they wouldn't have snow camps over there. <laughs> and uh, you could call, uh, for the youth, you could call John because he loved to talk about love. You could get him to come and speak to a youth fa uh, function and, and talk to you about I mean, there was everything in this big church. But God had said to them, I want you to go out and preach to the world. As the eagle stirs up the nest, what did God do then? Well, <clears throat> if you look in your scriptures, you go over to chapter 8, well, in Acts chapter 1, excuse me, and you see there he says to them, well, I'll give you power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and the area around Judea and then Samaria and so on. But what did God do? You turn over to chapter 8. You turn over to chapter 8, and it says... This is just a very short time afterwards. It says, at that time, a great persecution arose against the church. 
stirring the nest. At that time, a great persecution rose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. So what's happened with this stirring? What's happened with this, with this uh, persecution? They've spread. And you go down to verse 4, still in Acts 8, and it says, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. <laughs> well, how about that? You see, as the eagle stirs her nest, so the Lord. And there's an illustration of that right there in Acts, the first few chapters. You know what? God hasn't changed one iota. We may change, society may change, we may not like those changes, but God hasn't changed one iota. He's given every one of us the same command who we'll makes sure the rest of the world knows the gospel. And if we don't, sometimes as the eagle stirs the nest, so the Lord stirs ours. Sometimes we may, <clears throat> sometimes we may say no. We may say, I'm too scared to share Christ with anybody. I'm ashamed to. Or the other one that bugs me the most is sometimes people my age, in their mid-70s or whatever, 60s, will say, <clears throat> well, I don't know enough to go out and share Christ. What if they ask questions? And I think to myself, just a minute, you received Christ when you were 10 years old, and you've been in Sunday school and church and youth and all the rest for how many decades? I don't buy that. You can easily learn if you want to. Or I'm so comfortable with my Christian friends at church that I don't want to go out into the world. Or I'm so glad I belong to a company that's all Christians. That's not why we're here. I don't have time with all the things that I do, and I don't have time for church or Sunday school or youth group, and I don't really want to be a Christian among the guys who I work with or go to school with. And then we wonder why sometimes, all of a sudden, things go wrong, and the motorbike breaks down, and the girlfriend drops me, and I lose my job. An illness strikes, and my mom gets cancer. I'm not saying that everything that happens is God stirring the nest, but based upon God's word, I am saying that some of the time that is what happens. So you need to be careful that we don't fall into lethargy or more ap to ap apathy. And, <clears throat> and therefore not become what God wants us to be. Then it says, as the eagle flutters over her young and hovers over her young, then so the Lord. Now that's nothing new to the little eaglet. I mean, she's been in that nest now for quite some time, and <clears throat> she's seen her mother fluttering over and hovering over, and sometimes that's with food, and Sometimes that's uh, with protect for protection against some, something that's around. But the only time this little eaglet looks up is when it's hungry and then it gets fed and then it's comfortable again. However, when this little eaglet is supposed to be leaving the nest, then all of a sudden she realizes the wonderful aspect of a mother hovering over her in protection, hovering over her with things that she needs, etc. <clears throat> and it, it's a wonderful thing. Listen, <clears throat> God is not one to be taken for granted. Any more than if you're uh, just married or dating or something. That person is not 
should, should not be taken for granted either. And if you are taken advantage of them, well, look out. Around the corner, you could find some trouble. It just doesn't work well that way. I don't know about you, but <clears throat> most people, when they, uh, <clears throat> when they get into trouble, their prayer life becomes a lot better than it is the rest of the time. And you're a lot closer to God. I remember one of my daughter-in-laws when she was 32 years old, not Kim. And the, well, there is only one other one, but anyway, that's beside the point. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, <clears throat> she got breast cancer. They had two little kids. The youngest one was, I think, two. And uh, I won't take longer to explain some really good parts of that, but after it was all over, I said to her one day, well, looking back now, how do you... Uh, how do you process this? And she said, Dad, I've sure grown a lot closer to the Lord through all this. And that makes sense to me. We, most of us, live the same way. But God doesn't want us to be like that, taking Him for granted and all the rest, okay? Sometimes God will drop some things into our life for us to realize that we just can't take Him to, for granted. Or... He will drop blessings into our life, and one blessing after another. And some who are my age can look back over the years and say, Oh, God blessed me here, and God blessed me here, and He God blessed me here, and all of these places, okay? And we can tend to get comfortable too. And then all of a sudden, He starts to stir the nest with a marriage problem with a broken health, with death in a family, in order to get us to look up to see Jesus Christ and to respond to him more carefully. <clears throat> then I notice in Deuteronomy it says, as the eagle stirs up its nest, flutters over its young, spreads its wings to catch them, so the Lord... Many times, this little eaglet has seen this, seen this big, wide spread of wings, sometimes as much as 12 feet, I am told, and uh, see her soar off into the heavens. Very common sight. So good. When we're in trouble, remember God is big enough and strong enough to take care of you and your particular need. I know he can take care of everybody else, but I don't know. Yes, he can. He's big enough and strong enough to t and wants to take care of us. If you're a child of God and you have a need, then before, it says in the Scriptures, before I even see the answer and before I even pray, God sometimes starts to answer. And he may answer through you. He may answer through you, etc. Answer me through you, and so on. He's already working in people's hearts. And then the end of verse says, As the eagle stirs up the nest, hovers over its young, spreads its wings to catch them, carries them on its pinions, and bears them up, so the Lord. Excuse me, it's hard to preach a sermon and cut things out as you're going because you lose your track and you're thinking about what I can say next, but you're also not sort of what I'm doing this morning. We have a time frame here. When this mother eagle tries to force this little eaglet out of the nest, you say, ooh, that's cruel. But just a minute, is it really cruel for that mother to bring this little eaglet out of the thistles and glass and thorns and stuff to teach it to learn to fly when it has got to the place where it nerds to fly? No, that's not cruel. We might call it tough love today. 
I would love to see the site where <clears throat> this, this next beautiful site in nature, as the eagle, it says, if they can't get that little eaglet out of the nest, she will somehow squeeze sort of into the nest and get that eaglet up on her back. It's going to be a beautiful sight to see. And then she'll go out of the nest and she'll fly up 2,000, 3,000, 5,000, you know, just way up. And that little eaglet is just sitting there and she knows that mom is strong and capable and so on. And 5,000, 8,000, 9,000 feet, ooh, the power in mom and so on, the strength. And then all of a sudden, <clears throat> at let's say 9,000 feet, this mother eagle just goes into a lurch and pulls herself out from underneath this little eagle. These are real facts. And this poor little eaglet, I don't know if they had pampers in those days or not, but this poor little eaglet is flapping his wings as hard as he possibly can, and yet at the same time, he's going down and down and down so fast, and he's flapping his wings so hard, but it's not enough, and he's going down, and all of a sudden he realized that <clears throat> he's getting closer to the ground all the time. Oh my. And all of a sudden, the mother eagle, now watch this, will swoop down, and go just underneath the little eaglet and catch her on his back, on her back. Don't ask me how to spell that. <clears throat> and she then bears him up and carries him back up five, six, seven, eight, nine thousand feet. And all of a sudden she lurches again and here goes this poor little fella and he's just flapping his wings for all he's worth and, and trying to fly like mom does and it's just not working for him, near as good as it should be at least anyway. And he's going down and down and down and down and ground's getting closer and closer and closer and, and all of a sudden, guess what? She flies down right underneath him, and kawumph, he lands on her back. And then she takes her, this little eaglet, up again, and we are told that the, she will just keep, this, keep doing this over and over again until this little eaglet gets the hang of flying. Meanwhile, he's probably lost a lot of weight just worrying. And she continues to do this until the little eaglet learns, now watch this, that she will never allow me to be crushed on the rocks below, but will always be there in the time of need. As the eagle, so the Lord. That's our God. Amazing picture of God. And so the Lord works with us sometimes in financial struggles that we have, especially these days, and maritally or at school with friends, with parents, and circumstances can be cruel. Where is God? But you need to get to the place where you learn that as the scripture says, underneath are his everlasting arms. Underneath of us are his everlasting arms. Which means the lower you get in your circumstances and in your trouble, the more you go into the arms of God. And we need to learn this during the good times because it's pretty hard to learn that in the middle of the bad times. And then as you realize that underneath are his everlasting arms and he bears you up in this circumstance and he bears you up in another circumstance and so on, and you see the beauty of the world and things around in a much better way than you did before, 
and the magnificence and the wonder of walking with Him and the joy of walking with Him and seeing Him meet your needs and difficulties. And then, of course, in another sense, <clears throat> there's a futuristic sense to this because someday the Lord will bear us up to glory, eschatologically speaking. He will bear us up to glory. As the eagle stirs up the nest, what's God going to have to do to some of us maybe to get us out of the cult of the comfortable? As the eagle fluttereth over her young or hovers over them, are you actually conscious of God's presence and power in your life? Sometimes you will say to me, oh, if I had been 10 seconds earlier, I would have been in that accident. Are you conscious of God's protecting power over us, hovering over us? I was just reading Zechariah, I think. Yeah, Zechariah, the end of Zechariah on Friday night out on the deck. And lo and behold, I mean, I knew what I was preaching on here. Lo and behold, I see the term that God is hovering over his people in Israel. Well, bless the socks right off me. But that's what God's like. Are you conscious of his power in your life and his presence in your life? And as the eagle spreads its wings to <clears throat> catch them, are you conscious of the Lord's protection in, in your life? and his guidance as the eagle carries them on her pinions, bears them up. Are you conscious of the fact that the Lord will always bear you up and not let you completely crash on the rocks below? Are you trusting in him? What does it say? He who has begun a good work in you what does it say? you got to memorize that one. He who has begun a good work in you will perform it how long? Until the day of Christ. Ooh, that makes your whiskers stand up. Well, not yours, but yours. That's our God. We have a tremendous God. Do you enjoy his daily presence? You should. Well, just a few simple verse, couple of verses only from God's word that have some, some good applications to our lives. Isn't it interesting to <coughs> dig into God's word and find stuff along the way like that? I've always enjoyed my job as a pastor, studying the scriptures, figuring it out, and then figuring out how to communicate it to the rest of you and apply it. You can enjoy that too, of course, and I hope you do. Our Father, as we have just looked into this very simple scripture and and we marvel at the many ways in which you seek to show us your love and your care and your protection and your goodness to us. We pray that we might be able to see through some of the fog that comes into our life sometimes and see the message for us. And help us not to cry out, why, 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 but help us to come to you and say, what have you got for me to learn through this, Lord? And if we've been in the shall we say, the, the cult of the comfortable, unwilling to be the actual disciple that you've made us to be and called us to be, <clears throat> I pray that we will learn to, to walk according to the specs that you have made for us, knowing that that's the best place to be. And if there are some here this morning who have never placed their faith in you as they should have, <clears throat> and could have, I pray that you will tug on, the, the, tug on their heart and may they realize the benefits of turning fully to you. 
and I pray that today they might do so. And if there are some here who have not totally understood how you deal with us sometimes, I pray that <clears throat> they might understand and be responsive to you as well. May we all sense and know in a fresh way God's presence and care and love for us. Help us to learn to talk to you about our needs and those things that need changing in us. Because there's power that you will give us to do so. Help us to stop fretting at times and just realize that you're strong enough to bear us up. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.